Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm excited and delighted to be here. Um, I'm very grateful to the National Library of Israel for hosting this event on the birthday of the poet, the 111th birthday of Leah Goldberg. It feels to me um, very heartwarming that we're acknowledging the day of her birth and not the day of her death. And with that, we're, we're um, fully uh, seeing before us how much she has bequeathed us, how completely integrated into our lives here in Israel. And not only the words of Leah Goldberg are from the nursery school through uh, primary school and high school. and. She's part of the soundtrack of our lives here. Um, and there's a great amount of vitality to all of that. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling to acknowledge that. I'll immediately share my screen with you all so that we can embark on this lecture together. And I'll remark already at the outset that the title of today's uh, address was chosen in part to evoke, elicit a certain familiarity among many of you as of course the phrase, and will they ever, comes from one of Leah Goldberg's most iconic poems. It's an untitled poem, which I know many of you immediately uh, recognized, Ha'omnam Odyavo Yamin B'Sichon V'Kesed. And of course, in these particularly ravaged days in the world, it seems as uh, timely and necessary a statement as, as, as ever a question. Um, doubtlessly, these words resonate as powerfully as they do, not only because of the beautiful poem that, uh, that uh, follows, but also because of the music that was put to the, this poem and, uh, and then sung very beautifully and very famously by Chaval Alperstein. And of course, every Memorial Day, we hear these words and uh, not only on Memorial Days. I'll come back to this poem later in my lecture and I'll expand, I'll give you more than just the first line and I'll expand on translation choices that I made in this poem, but Already now, just looking at this one line and actually just looking at the opening word in the Hebrew, it feels to me a nice opening to this lecture that is much about the art and craft of translation because of the gap we see at once between the Hebrew and the English. You all see it, I see it also. The Hebrew word, again, it stands in as the poem's title because there is no title, Ha'omnam, is in Hebrew richly denotative and connotative, and it simply has no English equivalent. There isn't one. One could say that the word as such is untranslatable. And my translation, you can see, and will they ever, you can see it approximates and it tries to compensate for what in fact, it cannot deliver. And so I begin my lecture on Goldberg and on the translation on Goldberg with this statement that literary translation is a craft and an art form that acknowledges and contains with various types of loss in its very praxis. And that literary translation is a craft and an art form that understands the necessity for compromise. If you hear an emotional tone to these uh, statements and also a political assertion to these statements, it's because it is there. For me, verse translation, all verse translation, but certainly when I'm dealing with Goldberg, it is always emotional. And it is always framed by a political stance. And that too, I will get to later on. There is also something wholly paradoxical in how the verse translator proceeds in her work. Again, this is my experience, but I'm, I, I'm certain it's not only my experience. 
The verse translator proceeds with a strange and very complex intermingling of hubris and humility. She is striving for a perfect rendering of the original, a perfect rendering of the original, even as she knows she will most often fall short. So I offer you that as my opening. I'm simply highlighting here other words in these opening lines that certainly deserve attention and offer an additional glimpse into the complexity of translation work. I'm sure that you all hear the very Christian resonance of grace and forgiveness, and it is unavoidable. In contrast to the very Jewish resonance of Sicha Zechese, and this gap, another gap, deserves to be acknowledged even if it is not rectified. Um, I will, as I said, return to this poem later in the lecture, but I want to open with a few words about Goldberg. I imagine that many of you know a great deal about Goldberg. She really is prominent and preeminent in modern Hebrew letters. And so I won't stay here for too long, but I want just to, I want to mention just a few uh, moments in her life that perhaps are illuminating. So we know that she was born today, May 29th in 1911. She was raised in Kovno in Lithuania. And I'll pause here for a moment with this next piece, which maybe some of you know, and maybe you don't, that when World War I erupted, she, like many other Jews, was exiled to Russia with her parents and they wandered around. It was a turbulent and torturous time, but the real torture, the real trauma happened on the way back to Kovno at the end of the war. And it was a trauma imposed upon her father. And I will, um, I, I will offer you the image of it through Goldberg's own words as she describes this moment in her autobiographical novel, and he is the light where she writes about this moment. The entire novel is in third person. So here too, it's in third person. The, 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 this is a description of what happens to her father on the journey back to Kovno when the war is over. The border police focused their gaze on father's yellow shoes. They said these shoes were an obvious sign that he was a Bolshevik spy. Then they imprisoned him in an empty stable. Every day for 10 days in a row, they took him out as if they were about to execute him. This game went on for 10 days and the man broke. From there, there was no place to go but to the hospital. And indeed, Goldberg's father was in and out of uh, mental hospital, hospitals from then on. He was never part of her life from then on. And he remains a shadowy, absent presence in her oeuvre. I often wonder really how much of the secondary trauma of Goldberg uh, being part of this and losing her father at this moment can be found in her work that of course has many, many layers of dislocation and rupture and longing and sorrow and pain. I think this is an element that has been understudied. I'm uh, moving on from here, we know that Goldberg went on to do her PhD at the University of Bonn. And then she immigrated to Palestine in 1935. A year later, she sent for her mother. And from the moment her mother arrived in Palestine, Goldberg and her mother lived together for the rest of their lives. The father was never part of it. Um, th there, this is the moment to also acknowledge what, again, what many of you know, but deserves foregrounding, 
that Goldberg's mother language, her mother tongue was Russian, her second mother tongue or second language of fluency was German. And we can see she did her doctorate at the University of Bonn. She had a working knowledge of Yiddish and of Lithuanian, which means that this Hebrew poet who produced all of her artistic creations in Hebrew was working in what can be considered a fifth language. Of course, this was very much the, the order of the day. This was not exceptional in its day. And still, I want to acknowledge it as exceptional. Goldberg's relationship with Hebrew was an intense one. And while with other poets, we can sometimes find, I'm thinking specifically of Tuvia Rivner, a tortured relationship with the language he writes in. With Goldberg, as far as I can recall, I, we don't see this. And again, I'll offer you a passage from her autobiographical novel where she talks about choosing this language clearly. And ideological choice, but even beyond ideology. This is the passage that she offers. She, this is the character who stands in for Goldberg herself, she clearly remembered how one of her acquaintances in Berlin in the Department of Semitics would finger a book whose letters were squared, obviously that's Hebrew, and she could still hear his voice proclaim, choose a language as you would a ring, choose a language as you would a wedding ring and bless it. Behold, thou art sanctified unto me. And one can definitely feel Goldberg's relationship with what was her fifth language as having an almost sacred nature to it. And it is what she marries. She doesn't marry anybody else in her life, but the language she marries and commits herself to it wholly and quite magnificently. I will move on from here and and get to the poetry, which is, of course, the crux of the matter. And I want to share with you a poem that actually comes late in her oeuvre. It appears in her 1964 collection uh, with this night, which is the last collection that she publishes in her life. But it seems to me a, a foundational poem, even though it comes so late, because it actually is a poem where she explains what poetry is to her. This would be called an ars poetica poem. That it's a, it's a, a type of poetry that most poets end up writing once or twice or three times in their careers, where they talk about what is poetry? What is poetry to me? How do I understand it? How do I live it? How do I, uh, how do I pass it onward? Now, I'll pause for a moment just to acknowledge the title also in Hebrew, Alatzni, in English, I put it as about myself. And I know that some of you are hearing an echo of Rachel. And you're hearing Rachel's Rak alatzni yadati lesapir. And it's a, it, it is an echo that is present. It's interesting to know that Rachel's poem, Rak alatzni yadati lesapir, is also a very late poem. I think it's the penultimate poem that she actually writes in her life. And there are many similarities between the two poems, even as there are differences. And obviously, Goldberg would have known Rachel's poem. So let's take a look at this poem together in order to. Um, open up the conversation about translation, which is clearly where I'm going, and also to get a glimpse into Goldberg's own understanding of her poetic output. This poem comes in four sections. I'm going to share for now the first one, and this is how it goes. Obviously, the translations that I'm putting up are all my own. About myself. My days are engraved in my poems, like years of the tree, in its rings, like the years of my life 
in the furrows of my brow. I have no difficult words, valves of illusion. My images are transparent like windows in a church. Through them, one can see how the light of the sky shifts and how my loves fall like dying birds. Everything she does is so gorgeous. What I want to point out to you is, of course, the first line of the second stanza, where she makes an assertion, a statement, I have no difficult words. I would argue to you that this is an anticipatory self-diminishment that is, in my opinion, very gendered. We see it in other uh, female poets and other women poets, where I will get ahead of whatever the criticism will be. I want to acknowledge at this point that while Goldberg was definitely a central player in the literate of her day, she's in, she was always there, she always felt under-acknowledged. She always felt that she was pushed to the side. And this last book, the 1964 book, was actually panned and stopped her writing for a period of time. So her putting herself forward in this fashion, I have no difficult words, seems like a certain strategy. And I'm not saying she doesn't actually uh, embrace the simple. She does embrace the simple in many different ways, even as her work is always sophisticated, always complex, and all, always multi-layered. And we can see how her very assertion of simplicity is subverted by the next image she gives us, the simile, my images are transparent like windows in a church. Now, windows and mirrors also are everywhere present. They're omnipresent in her poetry, but these are windows in a church. And windows in a church are themselves works of art. And they frame the world that one sees through them, they frame and they color them. So that here too, we see how there is an assertion of simplicity, even as she seems to be countering it in this very intriguing simile. It bears noting that it's nothing short of surprising that this very Hebrew poet in the early days of the new state is using the windows of a church as her simile. And we acknowledge with this that Goldberg remains deeply rooted in the culture of Europe. And I would suggest perhaps she is uh, she is uh, asserting for herself an affiliation that is of a broader humanistic nature, Jewish and Israel, but also beyond. So I've given you the English and you can see that there's a blank space on the right side of the screen, which of course is where the Hebrew belongs. I have held this back so that I could have the opportunity to talk about the English before your eyes are on the Hebrew. And once your eyes are on the Hebrew, of course you are doing what we all do, what everyone does when we're confronted with a bilingual uh, edition. Of course, if we have access to both of the language, we are comparing and contrasting and we are saying no to this and yes to this, and that's completely natural. So now I will give you the Hebrew so you can embark upon exactly that. I'm not going to read the whole poem because we're short of time, but you can glance through it on your own. And what you can see, which bears acknowledging is in my opinion, the most significant difference between 
the Hebrew and the English, or rather the most significant departure of the English from the Hebrew has everything to do with syntax and the pace of disclosure. And what I'm pointing out are the last three lines, the last three lines in the Hebrew, in contrast to the last three lines in the English. The last three lines in the Hebrew are, of course, ve ech noflot kitzipurim metot ahavotai, and she accomplishes a, a, a real surprise with the final word of my loves. Something's dying outside, but we don't know until the very end of the poem that there is also that element present here. And in the English, because the syntax would have been so, in my opinion, tortured had I adhered to the, the, the flow of the Hebrew, it's changed around and how my loves fall like dying birds. And I point this out because I am always acknowledging what is shifted and what is changed and what is transformed even in the journey from the, 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 the original language to the target language. And yet I am completely committed always to bilingual editions, even though, as I said previously, the temptation is to compare the two texts as though the translation were a mirror image of the original. Of course, the translation is never a mirror image of the original, unlike a mirror image which reflects and inhabits the same space as that which it mirrors, the translated poem resides in a wholly different linguistic and cultural landscape. And I'm very exact with the language I've used in order to talk about this. Most prominently, the use of the word landscape. That of course, Goldberg herself, I'm speaking about the transition from one language to another and from one culture to another, but Goldberg herself is always integrating the two landscapes of her life into her poetry. She is considered the, the Hebrew poet or one of the most important Hebrew poets of the young state. And yet her heart and her eyes and her, and her musical sensibility are always looking back towards Europe. So that landscape, for Goldberg, and not only for Goldberg, is not only figurative, as I'm using it here, it is also literal. And here I offer you the second poem, it, the second section in the poem about myself. Again, an ars poetica poem that is continuing from section to section, and this is how it goes. Section two of about myself, simply, there was snow in one country, thorns in another country, and a star from the airplane window at night above many countries. And these things came to me and commanded me, sing. And they said, we are words. And I surrendered and sang them. It, when I was preparing this PowerPoint for you all, I realized that I'd gone back to about myself and I realized that she has an even later poem that resonates of this first stanza. It's in her final collection that is, of course, published posthumously. It's Sherit uh, Achayim, The Remains of Life. And I want to share it to you with you simply because of how poignant it is and how much it seems to be in conversation also with this poem. And this is how it goes. It's section four of The Remains of Life. Snow fell and in a foreign land, there was a war and they died in the snow as they do here in the spring in a foreign land. <laughs> 
I want to just remind you that this is a poem that she's writing in the very, very end of her life, meaning she's lived in, is in Palestine, Israel from 1935. She dies in 1970, meaning you can no longer consider her just off the boat. And yet all of us who have that divided identity know how it doesn't actually get less over time. In fact, it often does the opposite. So I'm going to just offer you again what many of you know that of course in this geographic and physical understanding of her poetry, it correlates very nicely with how translation lives in the world. And this is of course the, the Latin origin of the word translation, trans across Latio to carry and to carry across. I also have to admit that I appreciate the sense of the hard work that is involved in the carrying across. This is not something that just happens. This is something that one must devote oneself to with a lot of energy in order to uh, make it happen. And with that, I will open up a little bit more uh, directly the conversation about what leads the translator to make his or her choices. And I've divided this work into three categories, even though I'm acknowledging right at the outset that the division between these categories is very artificial, that when we talk about music, music is part of the meaning and music is sometimes uh, uh, um, uh, what comes out of the form and meaning is uh, intrinsic to the form. Everything informs everything. And that's part of the beauty of poetry, I would say, different from prose, where form and music are no less intrinsic than whatever the tale or the image is. And, uh, and I think that really is a big divide. So allow me to offer you one or two examples of what happens with the music. And then I'll move quickly on to form and to meaning. And I'm going to uh, put up on the screen an example I love. Those of you who have heard me speak about Goldberg in the past, you've heard this example, so you'll bear with me, maybe you don't remember, but it, uh, it manifests so exactly what happens in poetry and what the, the translator of poetry must be attentive to. And I'm giving you uh, the first section of a very, very early poem. This is from her 1940 book. Her first book was published in 1935, pretty much as she got off the boat. And that's uh, The Green Eyed Stalk. This is from her second book, Tabaot Ashan. And the poem, which is much longer, it has uh, this opening section called Yaldut. And it goes as follows. You can read the Hebrew and I'll read the English like stars that find their way to every window, like day peeking into every opened eye, like light, fingers that touched the dream's last thread and stirred joy and the fear faded and there arose song. So simple so simple and full. Ko pashut, ko pashut umale, kamo achu yarok ha mechabek et ashvil ha'avud v'tal v'tiltan v'tale. So obviously you see exactly where I'm going and where I'm going, you can look at any one of my translation choices. And of course, every translation choice bears investigation, but I'm directing your eyes to those final three lines that she has move across the page, which isn't something she does often. So when she does it, we sit up and take notice. Vital, vitiltan, vitale. You could just say that all day. The music of it is entrancing and it brings to life in the musical level, 
not just the meaning. Of course, every one of these words is from the world of the child. But besides that, I feel like I'm I'm skipping rope, the tal, titan, tale, and I'm enjoying myself in the fashion in which a child would. What does the translator do when the translator knows without any doubt that that sound pattern, and I'm speaking very specifically about the alliteration, even though she even doubles it with the tiltan, but the opening consonant sound of tal, tiltan, the tale must, absolutely must be recreated in the English because if I don't, I have failed in a way that is unacceptable. So what do I do? If we were in the room together or if your microphones were open, you would offer what you would offer. And every time I present this, I learn new things and, and, and uh, participants argue about why it should be this or why it should be that. Now, obviously, the one-to-one the -one translation falls flat on its face. I'll keep the first word, vital, and do, also because that first word is essential to the meaning of the poem. This is a poem about beginnings, and the tal, the do, is the beginning of the day. So I cannot forfeit on that. I can't start anywhere else. I feel wholly committed to it. Tiltan is clover, tale is lamb, and do and clover and lamb will not serve, will not serve this poem in the fashion in which it deserves. Again, I'm sorry that we can't have the debate together and all I can do is simply give you the choices that I made. As I said, I keep the do and I remain committed to the alliteration of the D because that's what's been established on the page. And I think, well, what flower or herb or weed can I give here in place of clover? And over the years, uh, students and colleagues have said, well, daffodil and other such things, but no, it is a daisy. Because a daisy has that same sense of whimsical, wild flower on the hillside that you could do, I love you, I love you not, there's something very childlike. And then of course, for the final, I need some, animal, I guess. Again, not everybody has agreed with this choice, and that's fine. I live peacefully with disagreement. The, where, the place I went was dove and felt very, very happy with it. Now, of course, I changed it from an animal on four to a bird in the sky, but I could see a dove in the, in the child's room. I could see all the extra elements that the dove integrates into this poem, the possibilities of peace. Of course, the lamb does that also with its Christian resonances, but uh, the dove serves the purpose very well. So this gives you an example of what the translator is doing. The translator is in a state of attentive listening, always. And the interesting thing, for me at least, and the exciting thing is that I'm listening doubly. I'm listening to what the original language is saying, what the original poem is saying, and then I'm listening to what is unfolding in the target language, in the language that the poem now must live in, in a, in a, in a, a beautiful way. I cannot forfeit the beauty. Now, when I talk about music, I gave you an example which one consider one can consider it actually quite simple. It's alliteration, and that's something that we can negotiate, or some can negotiate in an easier fashion. The question of music in a poem becomes much more complicated once we talk about meter and end rhyme. And I won't even go into the complexity of that, but I, what I will acknowledge is this is where form also comes into play. And I'm I'm um, I'm offering you the the um, the idea, not the idea, but I'm I'm sharing with you again what I imagine many of you know, that Goldberg certainly through much of her poetic career she worked in very formal 
poetic forms. She was devoted to them. It was also the, the convention of the day. And it's only with her 1964 collection, and then of course the poems that are then published after her death, where we see herself slowly moving away from that. When I'm speaking about inherited forms or classical forms or closed forms, I'm speaking about most prominently the sonnet, that Goldberg loved the sonnet. She loved in particular the Petrarchan sonnet, but she also integrated elements of the Shakespearean sonnet. She also translated the sonnets of Petrarch from Italian into uh, Hebrew. I didn't mention that after she had mastered Hebrew, she went on to master Italian and French and English. I don't know if she mastered it, but she certainly uh, had a working familiarity. And uh, what we see is that the moment we talk about the end rhyme of a poem, such as a sonnet, here we have the very famous sonnet, Oren, in a moment I'll give it to you in English, you can see that there is a rigidity here, which leaves very, very little room for the translator. And the debate about end rhyme in translations is a big debate. There are those who will go to the mat for it and insist that one must jump through the seven circles of hell in order to recreate it. And there are those who will not. And I'm amongst those who will not unless I can see that the poem has no life without its rhyme. And then either I'll decide not to translate it or all, at all, or I'll find a way to make it work. With this poem, I could see at once that the poem lives and lives well also without the type of manipulation I would have to, to impose upon it to make those end rhymes apparent. It's also worth noting that Hebrew is a much easier language to rhyme than English is. And that should be obvious also from the grammatical rhymes that we have in English, such as oranim, shonim, that's a grammatical rhyme, meaning it's a plural, right? Oren and shonil, shonair, are not the same, but the moment we make them plural, they rhyme with each other. So allow me to show you what I did with this poem, and you'll decide, I'll read just the first uh, uh, stanza. Kan lo shmat kol akukia, kan lo yachbosh ha'etz mitznefet shelek, aval betzel ha'oranim ha'ele, kol yalduti it's worth noting that she herself deviates from the rhyme scheme in the third line of that stanza. And here is the English. Here, I cannot hear the voice of the cuckoo. Here, the tree will never wear a cape of snow. But it is here, in the shade of these pines, my entire childhood comes alive. The chime of the needles, once upon a time. I call the snow space homeland, and the green ice that enchains the stream, the poem's tongue in a foreign land. Perhaps only migrating birds know, suspended as they are between earth and sky, this heartache of two homelands. With you, I was transplanted twice. With you, pine trees, I grew my roots in two different lands. I'll be honest with you, I'm really pleased with my translation. And I don't always say that. I go back to some of my translations and I see how it's not good enough. But I think this translation is good enough. And I think it's good enough, even better than good enough, to no small degree because of what I have achieved on the musical level. And I'll give you a few examples. There's very few end rhymes. Of course, there are the end rhymes, which are mono rhymes, meaning land and land and homeland and so on, and snow and, yo and uh, no, and snow and no, which appeared somewhat unexpectedly. But I'll show you what else I've done. And it's all very intentional. So here we have at the end of the first stanza and moving into the, into the second stanza, three 
assonances. That's when the vowel sound repeats itself in close proximity, pine, live, pine. Now, there are many other choices I could have made here, but I was listening for the music that could be integrated into the poem. And then I also paid attention to where I could insert rhyme, even if it wasn't end rhyme. And I'll give you an example. It's, uh, what is it? It's Silsul ha, ha eh, no, Pamone ha Oranim, that I made it the chime. And I made it the chime so it would rhyme with time. And even though it doesn't appear where end rhymes should appear in a, in a sonnet, it nonetheless carries the poem forward with its musical component. And we could move on with the other elements that are being integrated here. I'll give you a, just one more example of how I as translator have manipulated the English in order to add extra musical components. In the Hebrew, it's ze ha'ke'ev sheshtei amoladot. Ha'ke'ev is just ache, but I made it heartache so that it would have an alliterative relationship with homeland. The heartache of two homelands, and I love it. I love it. All right, I'm going to move on to the last piece of my lecture to you, and this is about meaning. And here I'm going to offer you two examples of what I'm talking about. But, and of course, I've only just touched upon the various elements that are at play with music and with form. With form, it's also the way the poem looks on the page and the difficulty in the transition from the very slender Hebrew to the much wider English, always a struggle that we uh, Hebrew verse translators deal with, but I want to look at meaning for a moment. And with for this, I offer you two statements, which are my statements, which I'm not alone in them, but I'm making them. Every translation is an interpretation. That's absolutely the case. Meaning when you are reading uh, David Grossman as translated by Jessica Cohen, you are reading her translation of him. Now with prose, one could argue it is perhaps not as extreme as it is with poetry. With poetry, it's extreme. Poetry achieves so much with so few words, which means that we, first of all, the reader, and then we, the translator, must make meaning from it. And we must insert a, a, an interpretation. Every translation is an interpretation. There is no such thing as an objective translation. Lokayam doesn't exist, all right? Just as there is no such thing as an objective reading of anything. And every translation, again, this is me, is filtered through and informed by the emotional and political world of the translator. And you could add to that the intellectual world and the sociological and the historical. Historical is important. How the historical moment in which I translate Goldberg's work will also impact on the way in which my translation unfolds. So in order to exemplify this for you, allow me to go back to the poem that we started with, Ha'omnam. And I'm going to give you um, only three of the four stanzas in the interest of saving time, all right? You can look at the Hebrew. I'm going to move through the English. And the point which I want to make is in the final stanza, which is on the next slide. And will they ever come? Days of forgiveness and grace, I'm sorry, it should be grace. When you'll walk in the fields, simpler wander, and your bare souls will be caressed by the clover, or the wheat stubble will sting your feet and its sting will be sweet. And you'll breathe in the scent of the furrow full and calm, and you'll see the sun in the rain pool's golden mirror, and all things are simple and alive. You may touch them, and you are allowed, you are allowed to love. Atilchi basade levadech, lo nitzrevet belahav hasrefot, badrachim shesamru me'imat, me'ima umidam, וביושר מבב שוב תהיי ענבה ונכנעת כאחד הדשאים, כאחד האדם. And the words which I want us to look at together are the words, is first the word נכנעת. 
you'll walk in the fields. Of course, in the Hebrew, it's a female figure walking, which is completely lost in the English. You'll walk in the fields alone, unscorched by the blaze of the fires, a long road stiffened with blood and with terror. And true to your heart, you'll be again humble and softened as one of the grass, as one of humankind. And you can see very clearly that I have made a leap from nichna'at to softened, that were I to go for, uh, an, let's say, a, a denotative, a dictionary translation, nichna'at would be, you'll be again humbled and surrendering, or you'll be again humble and overcome, you'll be, a, you'll, you'll be subdued, or something along those lines. And I couldn't go with that. And I felt as in I interpreted, I'm going to, to put that up front, that when Goldberg writes Nichna'at, she didn't need it in the military sensibility that I'm that I would hear if I put surrendering. She is inserting something that is of a different type. And hence, I allowed myself without too much trouble to go with softened. I felt that that was a, a more uh, evocative representation of what she was going for. The second, uh, the second um, a word worthy of our investigation and why I put this stanza up here is, of course, kechad ha'adam, which should be as one of mankind, right? Ha'adam. And I made a choice, and the choice was as one of humankind. Translating this, I think, in 2005, what probably would have done it before that, and I would certainly do it again today. And here I'll say frankly and very bluntly that I proceed in the world as a feminist literary translator. And with that, I'm acknowledging that male privilege and power are integrated into the language structure. And that's true for Hebrew, certainly. It's true also for English. As such, translations can intervene to disrupt, to foreground, and or to subvert that male privilege. When I write one of humankind, I am insisting that I too, and my daughter too, be represented there not just mankind, and I'm making that happen. And finally, I'm, I'm saying to myself what I know to be true in my own experience of translation, that translators always act upon and therefore are always transforming the original text. That is part of what we are doing. And that's, of course, an answer to those who are saying you're changing the original text. Well, of course, I'm changing the original text. That's what's a translation. That's what a translation does. I'm going to offer you one more example, and then I'll close with a final poem. This example is this poem is from Goldberg's uh, posthumously published collection called The Remains of Life, which um, I then translated the entire collection into, uh, into English, and it was published by Hebrew Union College Press um, as On the Surface of Silence. And as I already mentioned, in this collection, Goldberg departs in somewhat radical ways from the type of poetry she wrote previously. And you can see that already here, that this poem looks nothing like the previous poems that we've seen by Goldberg. It is somewhat fragmented. It has no title, very, very brief lines, no end rhyme. And here I'll also point out to you something that readers sometimes miss, even they, they don't acknowledge it, even when they feel it. It's a poem that doesn't have a single verb in it. There's not a single verb in it. Everything is suspended in space. In terms of its lexis, and also in terms of its images, and in terms of its uh, syntax and grammar, it's a very, very easy poem to translate. Very easy. However, it poses one very significant challenge, and that significant challenge appears three times in the poem. That significant challenge is the word segur. 
It's not, it's not the imperative. It's not the, the verb form of les go. It is a noun. Segor hachol v'ha'even. Segor shel hagar, shel antigona, sheli. Segor hachol v'ha'even. Ha'ahava k'mutzat asfatayim. Ha'gaava ha'mushpelet. Ha'elbon hage. בדרכי הגולים סגור החול והאבן, ושמיים קרובים, ובשמיים קוצה כוכבים. Not a single verb. Now, what does one do with the, with the word סגור? It, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't translate. So, of course, the first thing you do is you go to the dictionary and you look it up, right? And you discover that, oh my goodness, it has three very different denotations, and not any one of them really helps. The denotations are thorax or breastbone, pure gold, and fastener. And then you do the next thing that every Hebrew translator does, you go to the Bible. And you go and you look up, where does this word come from? Because maybe you'll discover something that you didn't know previously. And you find out, well, that the denotations are taken from these two verses. The first is from Hoshaya, Kishem Kedov Shakul, Ve'ekra Segor. I couldn't see the first uh, word there. Ef Geshem Kedov Shakul. And that's where the word, the enclosure of their heart or breastbone. And then in a very different context in the book of Job, the word is translated or understood to mean gold. When, when the question is asked, when wisdom, where will it be found? It cannot be gotten for gold. And then there's a whole list of other precious metals that follows. So I, while I'm happy to have this background information, it doesn't really help me in any very significant way. And then what I do is I, I, I immerse myself in the poem and I try to understand what the poem is saying. And this is where the interpretive level comes in. And here I'm saying to you once again, that that's unavoidable. And the first time I read this poem, and the second time, and the seventh time, and the hundredth time, I saw this figure, this Sheli, out in a desert landscape with Hagar and with Antigona, outcasts, those who are marginalized, but rebels also. Antigone is a rebel, and she's there, and she's naming a different sisterhood. And she's acknowledging that it's a harsh landscape. Again, this is my reading, but as the poem proceeds, it proceeds to, oh, I didn't mean that. It proceeds to a type of transcendence with Kotze Kochavim. And so I choose for Segol the word clasp. And with the word clasp, I get the gold, something that might be like jewelry. I get something which is perhaps more identified with women. I get a, something that closes also and even binds. The clasp of sand and stone, Hagar's Antigone's mine. The clasp of sand and stone, the tight-lipped love, the downcast pride, the proud insult. On the exile's path, the clasp of sand and stone, the sky nearby, and in the sky, thorned stars. I see transcendence. Now, what I want to say to you is I have had extensive conversations with colleagues who have seen this translation as taking the poem to, to a, a off path. And there are those who will read the Sagor HaChol V'Ha'Ezen as a grave image. It's not how I read it. Some other translator will come and will provide the translation that will reflect that reading. It won't be mine. This is mine. And this I too am quite happy with. I will end our uh, this lecture with 
of another poem by Goldberg. It is the last poem in the last book that she published in her lifetime. And you should know that poets pay a great deal of attention to what opens a book and what closes a book. And this poem is simply extraordinary. I then took this poem and I used it as a first poem for the collection, uh, the translation of Bishiri Tachayim. And I'm going to, uh, I'll put up the English so you can look at the English with the Hebrew beside it. But what I'm actually going to uh, do is let you hear Goldberg read it herself. I just realized I probably didn't share uh, sound. So I'm, I'm doing that again so that we can actually hear Goldberg, her voice. And we'll end with Goldberg's voice. You see it, yes? Yes, so I'm gonna go all the way down. We'll hear Goldberg read this poem. Hashanim perkisu et panai bezichrona havot, va ando le rashi hutei kesaf kalim, ad yafitim od. Beinai nishkafim hanofim, udrachim shavarti yishru tzadai. Ayefim beyafim. Im tireni achshav, lo takir et tmolecha. Ani holechet elai befanim shebikashta lashav kshahalachti elecha. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you very much. There are a few questions. Um, Toby asked, how did she support herself in Israel? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, she, at the beginning of her career, she, she wrote for the newspapers and then she was offered, um, she was offered a position. That was when she lived in Tel Aviv. And then she was offered a position uh, actually founding the comparative literature department at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And she moved with her mother to Jerusalem. They lived in Rehavia. Um, and, uh, and she spent the rest of her life at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, it, was, it was not a happy fit. She struggled a great deal there. And in her, in her diaries, in her Yomanim, you can hear how much she felt belittled and, and they withheld money. And oh, well, it sounds like nothing has changed, right? Um, but if you go up to Mount Scopus now, you can see an exhibit of, uh, I think it's a, a permanent exhibit just outside of the, um, out of the library. And it's actually an exhibit that was put together by Professor Gidon Tukotsky, who is really the preeminent scholar of Goldberg uh, in Israel and maybe anywhere. And you can see the letter she wrote to the rector and asking for her pay. And, and there are many, many reports from students who sat in her class and remember how popular her classes were and her particularly smoky voice. She, she was of course a lifetime smoker and she had that very deep voice with her very distinctive accent. So the, the second part of her life, she supported herself by, as an academic. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Etty asked, uh, uh, re regarding uh, about myself, yes, she asked if it could be translated in a way that would uh, render the poem less ars poetic. Huh, that it should be less. Uh, well, the, the the in the poem she's talking about poetry, so it it, it, it will always be also ars poetica. It, 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 there's no way to avoid that, and I wouldn't actually see why one would want to avoid it. Um, so I, I'm, I can't see how that would change in the translation um, in the translation choices. I don't know if you're saying if I have no difficult words, are, are you implying perhaps Etty that she's talking in a more general fashion? I, I can think about that, but my, my inclination is to say no because she's always reflecting on herself also as a poet. Uh, on her grave, she, there's a, a, a verse from one of her poems where she says, and the words were sat heavy on my lips and the words 
sat on the stone on my lips. I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember it exactly. And, and it seems to me unavoidable or inevitable that one needs to read that as her relationship with poetry. She was always a poet. I mean, she was writing poems fr from her girlhood days. She was writing even Hebrew poems from her girlhood days. And you can see them and also with the spelling mistakes she makes. Um, of course, she also, she also wrote literary essays. She also wrote a play. She also wrote a novel. She, she also had a very significant body of translation. So she did many other things. She wrote children's books and children's verse. But we remember her, first of all, as the poet that she was. Yes. I, I see someone asked if I, I'm just going to plunge in there, Dawn, I hope that's all right. Someone asked if, uh, if I read the poems out loud in order to assess the sound. Always, always, always. I read the Hebrew out loud, and then I, even, I read the English even more obsessively out loud. And not only do I read it out loud, but once I've completed or think I've completed a translation, an absolutely necessary stage in the work is is to put the translation aside and to walk away for a good period of time, not for an hour and not for a day. And it always feels to me that something happens while I walk away, like there's some fermenting process that happens on the page without me even knowing. And then I come back and I discover what is absolutely right or what is absolutely wrong. And that goes on for a certain period of time. It's what I do with my own uh, trans, what my own poetry, uh, 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 production where you're, you're finished writing a poem and you're so certain it is the best poem that's ever been written on the planet and then you walk away you come back a week or two or a month later and you discover what's the work you still need to do thank you so so much uh professor rachel beck uh, Pleasure. uh thank you all for being here with us uh, there are many, many compliments in the chat room. I, I'm going to send you the transcript so you can read them Thank yourself. You. I just there's there's too many to read out loud, and they're all very emotional and very wonderful. Uh, Thank so you. Th Thank you all. Thank you all once more for being here with us. Thank you, Professor Rachel Svea Beck. Back. Um, Thank I'm, you, Dawn. Thank you, Dawn, for all your work. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I will open microphones if anyone uh, else would like to say thank you or uh, regards from wherever you are or have any further questions. Um, for those in the panelist room, for those in, still in the attendee room, I've been trying to move you in to the panelist room all evening. If you have a question, please raise your virtual hand and I'd be happy to move you in now so you can open your microphone. Thank you all once more. Happy Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, thank you. from Jerusalem. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Rachel, that was amazing. Oh, no, we thank you for making this happen. This is really <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, hanging on every word. You really thank brought you. the thank translation you, process to life in your most articulate and passionate way. Thank you, Nomi. Nomi was the one who put the National Library in touch with me. So I'm beholden to you. I'm very no, grateful. absolutely Thank not. You. We're very Thank grateful. You. It was just it was a good it was a good shit. It was a good shit. You're a good shit, Hanit. Go, go, go. <laughs> All the best. Thanks, Nomi. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everyone and okay. goodbye. Have a good evening goodbye. from South Africa. Oh, nice. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. Thank you so much. And from bye. Belgium. Belgium, <laughs> nice yes. to see you. Yes. A very good introduction uh, in the poetry. I am going to try to find a, a translation here. You'll, you'll, you'll find, a Hebrew Union College Press has, has a book uh, and, um, and the Toby Press has another book of translations. Ah. You can find them there. Yes. Yeah, okay. those are the, the, the presses that have published uh, my translations of Goldberg in book form. Yes, it's wonderful. Thank yes. you. Yes, all the best. Yes, same all right. Thank you so uh, much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all once again. Toda Rabba, Laila Tov.
תודה דורון, כל טוב. ביי ביי. לילה טוב. Was a pure beauty.